our reading is from Matthew 13, 10 through 17, and 34 through 35. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lainey. Good morning, everyone. Please have a seat. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So glad you're here today on this rainy Sunday morning. It would be so easy to lay in bed and sleep, listening to the rain on the windows. So now is your time to catch up on your rest. Close your... No, don't do that. <laughs> Just kidding. So welcome to New King. If you're here as a visitor, my name is Eric. I'm part of the leadership team here. There's actually four of us, and two are away. As, uh, as we heard, Pastor Ben is away on vacation, uh, and Lu Lucius is too. And so you're left with Aaron and I. So watch out. <laughs> if I haven't met you, please take the time if, if after the service just to say hello. I'd love to meet you and say hello. Or if you have a question about today's sermon, Lay it on me. I'd love to talk about it. That would be great. So uh, we all love a good story, don't we? And, and we find that uh, Jesus does as well. And as we turn to um, this chapter in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 13, we find that Jesus tells uh, seven stories, seven parables about the kingdom of heaven. And uh, after the first one, we see uh, that the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him a question. Why? Why do you speak to the people in parables? Why do you use this particular technique of communication? Why do you do that? And so we find that Jesus actually answers that question. And his reply stretches back 6,000 years or 600 years, to, uh, to Isaiah the prophet. So he answers in terms of the great prophet Isaiah. So in my sermon this morning, we'll, we'll answer three questions about parables. First, what is a parable? It's good to define what we're talking about. And then why? Why did Jesus speak in parables? Number two. Number three, what is the effect of the parable? How does it affect the hearer? And then number four, we'll, we'll ha I'll have a few takeaways from, from what we talked about, from this passage, a few applications from today. So what is a parable? Why did Jesus speak in parables? What's the effect of the parable? And then a couple applications. So let's, let's pray now. Uh, Father God, please bless this word as it goes forth. Uh, let us have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches through this portion. Father, help us to understand. Help me, Father. Help me to convey what your spirit wants me to convey this morning through this passage. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. What is a parable? Very, very simple. I'll give you the answer. It is a succinct, meaning shorter, 
right, Aaron? I didn't want to use the word too big for you. A succinct story that uses elements that we are familiar with to tell us a spiritual truth. For example, a parable may talk about farming or gardening. It may talk about cooking. It may talk about fishing. Things that we've all seen, we all can relate to, and uh, it brings forth a spiritual truth. It's a succinct story using familiar elements or experiences to illustrate a moral or spiritual truth. And when we see them in Scripture, we find that the parables tend to expose our hearts. It tends to touch us, and it causes a reaction. So uh, Bible scholar Kevin DeYoung says about parables, he says one thing to do when you read a parable, it gives a familiar scenario, but sometimes there's something in the parable that's a little surprising, a little out of place. Kevin DeYoung says, look for that. That sometimes gives us, gives us a key about what's going on in the parable and what truths are being taught. For example, the parable of the sower that Ben taught us about last week. You know the story. The, the sower goes out and he sows his seed. Where does he sow it? He sows it everywhere. He sows it indiscriminately. He sows it on the hard surface. He sows it on the rocks. He sows it on the thorn. Who does that? You don't sow your seed that way. You sow your seed only on prepared ground if you're a good gardener. So, one lesson, one way to preach about the parable of the sower is to say, oh, this is different. The lesson is the word of God goes out to all. Indiscriminately, yeah? So that's a, something that's different. Another thing that's different about that parallel is we see that the farmer, the gardener, he just throws his seed out there and he does nothing more. He doesn't weed, he doesn't cultivate, he doesn't fertilize, he doesn't water. What farmer does that? That's the odd thing. What lesson might we draw from that? One way to preach that parable is to say, we, you and I as Christians, our responsibility is to sow the seed, the word of God, then God gives the increase. He does everything else, yeah? So, so that's the odd thing about parables. There's sometimes with the longer ones, there's something very different parable of the prodigal son. We all know it. It's named the prodigal, prodigal son, and we all focus on that. The son that said to his father, I want, I want my share, I want to go out, and we focus on how God receives him back, and that's wonderful. But the odd thing about that parable that we miss is the older son and his reaction and relationship to his father, and we find that the parable is really about him. That's what that parable is about, and I could give you three sermons on that, but I won't this morning. So sometimes with a parable, the truth, the lesson is hidden in plain sight. Even though it uses things that, that are common and obvious to us, the truth is hidden in plain sight. So with that in mind, how does Matthew 13 open? Let me just give you just a couple thoughts on that. We didn't read it this morning, but Matthew 13... Verse 1, the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Great crowds gathered about him, so he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables. So we have this scene. Painters throughout the years, artists have loved to paint this scene of Jesus in a little boat, the crowd standing on the beach. It's beautiful. It's touching. But is there something more to that? Maybe there is. When we read in Scripture, we find out that the land, the idea of the land, is something that was very Jewish in nature. The promises always involved the land. I will restore you to the land. And then the beach is sort of a transition area. And then the sea represents the nations. So what do we see? We see Jesus in a boat out into the sea. The people are on this transition area, the beach, and Jesus is teaching. Is that maybe... An enacted parable to set up the seven parables that Jesus teaches? Because what's happening in, in the Gospels here? The people are starting to resist against Jesus. 
and, and Jesus brings them to this point of transition. They're on the beach, and there he is, and he's in the boat. And what is a boat? It's nothing but a piece of land in the middle of the water. So there he is, Jesus out there in the heart of the sea, looking alone, looking like he's in peril maybe because of the sea. And isn't that how the kingdom of God works? I'll leave that for you to think about. So maybe there's an, inv- an enacted parable here where we see Jesus bringing people to transition, moving out into different lands, lands that may be more difficult, out into the sea. Okay, so why did Jesus speak in parables? It's a sink story, familiar elements, illustrates a moral truth, exposes and touches the heart. Second question. Why did Jesus speak in parables? Here's the answer. I'm going to give you the answer, and then I'm going to show you why it's true. Right? I'm going to prove it to you. Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament pattern of prophetic teaching. Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament pattern of prophetic preaching. How do I know this? Did I just make it up? No. I get it from the text. If you look at this chapter, we see in verse 14 that Laney read as part of the reading, indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. So we see this reference to an Old Testament prophet being fulfilled. The prophecy is fulfilled. A little further on, down in verse 57, I do have 57, Um, We find that they took offense at him, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. So we see see that it ends with this idea of Jesus taking on this role of a prophet that's not accepted. He also mentions it um, in verse 36 or verse 35. That was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. So there's three instances in this very chapter where we see Jesus referencing a prophet. So he is fulfilling the role of this Old Testament prophet, but now coming into the New Testament. It's this pattern of prophetic preaching. So Then we must ask ourselves, okay, if this is the role that Jesus is fulfilling, what is a prophet, and and what do they do? Our first answer always is, oh, they tell the future. Yes, but that's a partial answer. How many people ever, like, did an exam and only got partial credit? You only get partial credit if you say he foretold the future. A prophet in the Old Testament was raised up by God usually in a time of weakness or transition, and he called out the heart condition of the people. He gave a diagnosis of their heart condition, and often it was sinful. And he called them to repentance, and then he said, if you don't repent, here's what the future is going to bring. That's where your partial credit comes in. He does talk about the future often, but at most commonly calls out the heart condition of the people, calls for their repentance, calls for them to change, and if they don't, God says, I've had enough, I'm going to come, and I'm going to come in judgment against you. Page two. And this is exactly the role that Jesus does here in Matthew 13. Remember, the Old Testament prophets were raised up by God to expose the heart, many times the sinful heart of the people. In the process, they foretell God's impending judgment against them. As this chapter unfolds, that's exactly, exactly what Jesus does. So he is fulfilling the prophetic preaching pattern, three Ps, of the Old Testament prophets. And in the Old Testament, When people refuse to hear the clear teaching of the prophet, God often has the prophet change his tactics, change his way of communicating to the people. He says, okay, I've given it to you clearly. Now I'm going to change things up a little bit. And so we find that in the book of Ezekiel, for example. Great prophet Ezekiel. Um... Chapter 3 ends with, Ezekiel 3 ends with this. 
He who will hear, let him hear. He will refuse to hear, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. Does that ring a bell? It's very similar to what's here in this chapter. What happens in Ezekiel 4? No one knows except for me because no one's read Ezekiel in a long time. You know what happens in chapter 4? What happens in chapter 4? <laughs> All right, Liz. Bang. <laughs> I better get it right then. So Ezekiel 4 begins a series. He says God won't listen anymore. So Ezekiel 4 changes it up, and, and Ezekiel does a whole bunch of enacted parables. The first one, God says, take a brick. Okay, a brick. Write the name uh, Jerusalem on it. Okay, now lay a siege against it. So he's like got a little play set. Maybe he's got some Legos going, you know, little guys coming up. And he starts this series of enacted parables to try to get the message across. We see the same thing with Jeremiah. Same thing. I won't take time to look at it. And then we see it in Isaiah. And Isaiah is most pertinent because that's the chapter that Jesus, that's the prophet that Jesus goes to when he responds to why do you teach him parables? Why do you give the people parables? He goes to Isaiah. So why did Jesus speak in parables? To, to, to be just like the Old Testament prophets, to use their pattern of preaching to the people. He is in sync with that. He is in line with that. He is fulfilling that. So what's going on in Matthew? As I mentioned, he's starting to see resistance. He's starting to see outright defiance. We saw that in the 12th chapter where they said, you, you, you cast out demons by the prince of demons. The resistance is coming. And so Jesus says, okay, it's time for me to switch gears. It's time for me to use a different technique to preach to you. I'm going to tell you some stories now. Right? You see how it fits? Friends, tell me, let me tell you. Scripture is absolutely, utterly amazing at how it fits together from Genesis to Revelation. It fits. Okay. Part three. What is the effect of speaking in parables? things. I'm going to tell you what they are, and I'm going to show you as we unfold this section. Per our passage in Matthew 13, there are two clear effects. Effect number one, parables further harden the heart of the rebellious. Parables further harden the heart of the rebellious. They deafen, per our scripture, they blind, and they dull the rebellious heart. Very interesting. Number two, parables further enlighten the hearts of the faithful. Parables further enlighten the hearts of the faithful. Parables bless the faithful by unveiling mysteries hidden since the foundation of the world. So parables harden the hearts of the rebellious. Parables enlighten the hearts of the faithful. Now let's go to our main text. I've been talking a lot about a whole bunch of different things to set you up for our reading. I want to give you some background, some insight, some understanding before we dive into this. Verse 10. We have the question. Verses 11 through 17, we have Jesus' answer. So the question. The disciples came to him and said to him, why do you speak in parables? It's interesting, he says, why do you speak to them? So already we see in this setup, there, there is a sort of division between the people. There are the disciples, and then there's the crowds. There seems to be already a difference of the way things are being set up here. So they come to Jesus, and they ask him the question, why do you tell stories? Why do you tell them stories? Why do you use parables? Why now do you do this? And then the answer comes. And he answered them in verse 11. And what we see is, in verses 11 to 12, the answer comes in three parts. In 11 to 12, we see this contrast between the faithful and the rebellious. So there's a contrast in verse 11 to 12. Verses 13 to 15, we see the negative side of the contrast. And 16 to 17, we see the positive side. 
So Jesus answers and says, okay, here's my answer. There's a difference. There's a contrast with people. There's a negative side and a positive side. So let's see how that unfolds. Verse 11. He answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it has not been given. Does that surprise you? Does that kind of, wait a minute, I thought the gospel went out to, uh, what, 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 what's, what's going on here? What's happening? We start to see this, this contrast to some that's been given, to some that hasn't. And that makes us really, really nervous. It brings up the age-old debate of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. And what I mean by that is, is God, the way that we understand how God's kingdom works, God is sovereign. He is in control. And so that if any person comes to Jesus, it's because the Father brought him, drew him there. It was the Father's work, the Spirit's work, bringing the person to Jesus. In fact, we would go before that and say before the foundations of the world, there's something called predestination and election, that the person was chosen before the foundation of the world. And that makes us even scareder and nervous that there were some chosen and some not chosen. That's the debate. If God chooses, how can we ha be held responsible? So the, 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 the dilemma is God's sovereignty versus man. How can he still hold us responsible if it's him that chooses? I can only say three things about that today, right? I'll only say three things. One, for those that accept the kingdom of heaven, we bow before Scripture because it clearly teaches us that all, it's all God's work from start to finish. It is God that is in control. It is He that predestines. It is He that calls. It is He that justifies. It is He that glorifies. We we didn't even have the power to respond. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Some people say, well, it's like we're out in the water and God throws a life raft, a life ring, and we grab on. We're dead. We can't grab on. It is God through his spirit that quickens us, that enlivens us, and allows us, and enables us to believe. And we walk through the door of the gospel which said, whosoever will, and we walk through that door and we turn around and it says, I knew you before the creation of the world. We bow with that and said, okay, God chose. But then we have to bow before a scripture that says those who reject the kingdom, we must acknowledge and bow before a scripture that they are completely and utterly responsible for their choice. The two are there. A great example I always use is, uh, is Babylon. Now, on the Old Testament days, Babylon was used as a hammer God raised up Babylon to punish Israel. God said, I raise this people up. I send them to you to punish you. And then a little later, God says, because you punished my chosen people, I'm now going to punish you, Babylon. So God raised them up. God still held them responsible. So what do we do with this? This idea, these two things. We struggle with it. There's no two ways about it. J.I. Packer, a Christian theologian, says, these two truths are like the tracks of a train. In order for the train to run, you must have both tracks. Yeah? But you can't bring them together, really, because the train will crash. <laughs> so we hold these true truths. It's part of the mystery of the kingdom, I think. And so Jesus says, to you it has been given to know, but to them it has not. It's how it works. It's how the kingdom works. If you want to read more, read Romans chapter 9. Yeah, if this is going to keep you up at night, and I hope it does, because it's a wonderful truth of God. Read Romans chapter 9. J.I. Packer wrote a great book called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, written back, I think, in the 60s. Great book that helps explain some of this. 
So let's move on from that. So we see that one of the principles of the kingdom is to some has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom, to others it hasn't. So let's move on a little bit. How are we doing time-wise? Oh, we're doing good. Verse 12. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. We learn that one of the principles of the kingdom is you can't stand still. Do you hear me? You can't stand still. You can't just stand in one place. You're either increasing or you're decreasing. You're either coming more towards the kingdom or you're running away. For, you're either accepting it or you're rejecting it. This is how the kingdom works. It drives you to a decision. Because you can't stand still. It's pushing you one way or the other. And we see this in life, do we not? We see people that hear the gospel. They believe it. They're drawn to it. They accept it. They become Christians. And their life is changed and they move on into the mysteries of the kingdom. Then we see people that say, I don't want it. And they're driven further and further and further away. It's very solemn, very sad. Then we see people, think of Ben's sermon last week, the parable of the sower. Then we see people that hear it and they're all excited. We see people. And then something happens. The cares of the world come in. An issue arises. What about the gender debate? I'm not following the God that says that. And they go further and further. And we don't see them anymore. And they don't come anymore. And you talk to them. And they're so distant from God. Those who are so excited. This is how the kingdom works. You either increase or you decrease. Yeah? You either increase or you decrease. There's no standing still. And the preaching of parables brings this out. The preaching of parables brings this out. So let's look at the negative side, verse 13 through 15. Jesus says, This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor they do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. You will understand, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive, for these people's hearts has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely hear, and their ears they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would hear, heal them. Jesus reaches back to the prophet Isaiah, and I want us to reach back as well, to get an understanding of what's going on. So if you have a Bible, turn back to Isaiah. And this quote is from the sixth chapter, but I want you to look at the first chapter of Isaiah. I want to give you a, just a short introduction because we always want to look at things in context. We wanna want, always want to see what's going on. So Isaiah, um, let's see. Isaiah was a prophet of God that prophesied to Israel or to Judah around 700 BC in the first five chapters true to Old Testament form Isaiah has a vision from God that calls out the heart condition of the people their consistent and persistent and continual sin and that God has had enough so you look if you look at chapter 1 and verse 2 hear O heavens give ear O earth the Lord has spoken, and here's the pronouncement. Children have I reared up and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Oh, sinful nature, nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers. And so it begins. This heart condition of the people is revealed by God to the prophet Isaiah. And it continues. Look down around uh, verse 18 of the first chapter. 
God says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, this idea of hearing and doing is there. If you, if you turn, come, let's talk through this, God says. But the indictment and the condemnation continues. We see it through chapters 2, 3, Four, five. Chapter 5 is interesting because Isaiah pronounces woes upon the people. If you look at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 8, woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field. Woe to those who all they can think about is the lust for more stuff. Woe upon them. A little further on. Verse 11, woe to those who rise up early in the morning that they may run after strong drink. They tarry late into the evening as wine enslaves them. Woe to the people who all they can think about doing is partying, right? No, no, no appl application to us today, right? None. Verse 18, woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood, who draw sin as with cart ropes. Verse 20, woe to those who call evil good, and good evil. Do we not live in that day, my friends? Verse 21, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> I live in Vermont. I do what I want. Yeah? Verse 22, woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drinks. So the, all these woes, the heart condition of the people is clearly described. And then we come to chapter 6. This is the portion that Jesus quotes from. Chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. King Uzziah was a pretty good king. Now he's dead. Hope is gone. Things are turning down, and what happens? Isaiah sees the Lord. I have a vision. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. Two covered his face. Two covered his feet. Two flew. On one and one to another, they called and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So Isaiah gets this vision of God and all his glory in his holiness in particular. That's what this is bringing forth, the holiness of God. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. A terrifying and awe-inspiring vision of God. And what is the response of our friend Isaiah? And I said in verse 5, woe is me. Remember chapter 5? I just talked about it a couple minutes ago. He talked about woe to the people. Now he says, woe is me. Why? It's a whole other sermon, but just look at this. When you come face to face with God, it's not somebody else's sins that are exposed. It's yours. You come face to face with God, and your sins are exposed. You're expo and you say, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people. It's not just them, it's me, it's all of us. You are exposed. Your heart, your sinfulness is exposed. Okay, let's move on. I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hopes. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand, in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned. And then I heard the voice, Isaiah says, of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then Isaiah says, Send me. I will go. You see what's happening here. Now Isaiah is set. He's ready. His sins have been taken away. He's seen the Lord. Now he's ready. And God says, go and say to the people. Now here, finally, after all this preamble, is the quote that Jesus quotes. Go and say to the people. This is the commissioning sermon that Isaiah will give 
to this people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. It is a pronouncement upon the people of dullness and blindness coming in because of their rebellion. And Isaiah responds, how long, O Lord? How long do I preach this message? What, how, how long shall this go on? I'm not sure I want to say this, but how long? Verse 11, how long, O Lord? Then he said, until the cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate, desolate waste. And the Lord removes people from far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain, it will be burned again. Can you imagine this is your commissioning sermon? This is, what, this is your first one. You're going to go out in the power and the, and the authenticity of the Lord, and this is what you're going to preach to the people? Your city is going to be laid waste. It's going to be destroyed. The people are going to be dragged off. And oh yeah, those that remain, we're going to burn it again. How about that? What's going on here? But wait. Verse 13. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is the stump. And now, now we get a glimpse of hope. We get a glimpse of a stump that's left. The city has been burned down. It's been burned again. There's nothing left but a stump. And from that stump, what happened? It's picked up again in Isaiah 11, chapter 1. And there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. Jesus is from the line of Jesse. There shall come forth a shoot. Even though everything is burned to the ground, there's going to be a shoot that comes up from the house of Jesse. And then chapter 11 unfolds into one of the most beautiful chapters of restoration in all of the Bible. Read it. Read it. You'll see amazing things happen through this shoot. Now back to Matthew 13. What is happening in Israel? The Jewish people in particular, the leaders, are rebellious. They're going against Jesus. They will not have him. And it comes to a point where they say, we will not have this man reign over us. Give us Barabbas. We'd rather have a thief. Crucify him. And our Savior, Jesus, goes to the cross. And then he's resurrected. <laughs> in, that, in that terrible thing that happened where all hope is lost, there's a shoot. There's a little thing that comes to life. There's green that happens. And it's the resurrection of Jesus, the first fruits. And the gospel goes out of the kingdom to the Jew first, and then the Gentile. And the Jews, they won't accept it. They fight against it by and large. They begin to persecute the Christians until AD 70. Titus comes through Jerusalem with his armies, and what happens? The city is destroyed. Do you not see the connection? Do you not see the parable? Do you not see the story that began in Isaiah continues now in Matthew and even to our day. We are part of that story, you and I. We are part of the parable. The kingdom comes in smallness, in weakness, and defeat, but from it sprouts everything. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, boy, I am out of time. positive side of the contrast. Back to Matthew. I've got to close with, with that, and then just a couple quick applications. I thought this, I was telling Aaron, I thought this might be a short sermon. I guess I get excited and it's not. Verse 16 of our chapter, blessed are your eyes for they see, and your ears for they hear. 
For truly, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and they did not see it. To hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Further on, I will open the verse 35. This was to fill, fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Do you not see that upon us? Upon you and I today in 2021 at New King Church, if you're a Christian, the secrets, the mysteries of the kingdom have come upon us. We see with eyes that, see, that can see. We hear with ears that can hear. We start to see these connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We start to see the principles of the kingdom and how they work. The blessings have come upon us. I can't go into any more than that. But let's go to the end. So a couple of applications. So first of all, a very practical one. Our witness to the truth today. If you're a Christian and you're out there witnessing about Jesus, if you're talking to people about Jesus, this is no surprise to you. It shouldn't be. But there's going to be a reaction. The mysteries of the kingdom, the parables of the kingdom, the gospel of, of Jesus presents a reaction. It will have a profound effect upon people. Some people will be drawn to it. Some people will call you names and run from it. Don't be surprised at either one. Understand that this is how the kingdom works. Number two, the kingdom of God comes by hearing. Yeah, hearing these parables, seeing them, understanding them. The Jews wanted a kingdom to come in force. They wanted the kingdom to come like a boulder rolling down a mountain and crush the Roman armies. They wanted the, their enemies to be crushed. They wanted to be restored to place and power and purpose. That's what they were expecting the kingdom to be. But no. The kingdom of God comes by hearing, and the kingdom is in a mystery. Let me give you three characteristics of the kingdom from these seven parables, just quickly. The kingdom comes in smallness, weakness, and it's internal, working behind the scenes, working underground almost, not by the power of a boulder. We see immense power of the kingdom hidden in plain sight. The seed of the sower, something dead goes into the ground and life comes forth. We see it in the parable of the mustard seed. The smallest of seeds, Jesus said, grows into the biggest of trees. Wait a minute, did Jesus mess up his botany? I thought that mustard was a plant. There's a parable as a lesson in that. Don't have time to tell you about that. The leaven, the leaven goes into the, to the bunch of, of dough and it works through it unseen until it's all leavened. So the kingdom is in a mystery. It's, it's, it's small, it's weak, it's internal. But there's a final judgment lo looming. There's two parables that talk about a final judgment. And we see that in the kingdom, there are two groups heading for judgment. It's a mixed group, the wheat and the tares, and the, and the parable of Annette. You didn't know that, that my wife had a parable about her. A terrible bad dad joke, I know. Parable of Annette. There's a final judgment that's in two of the parables. Do you have ears to hear? The kingdom is exceedingly precious. There are two parables about that. The hidden treasure, the pearl of great price. Those are the, those are the things we learn about, the principles of the kingdom that we learn here. And finally, as I said earlier, you cannot stand still when it comes to the kingdom to those who today are struggling with this, who are saying, I don't like this, I don't see it, I don't want it. I warn you. In a month, you'll find yourself a step further away. In a year, you won't even remember. This is how the kingdom of God works. You cannot stand still. It either drives you forward or it drives you away, pushes you back. I warn you, you need to have ears to hear. 
Romans 10 8 says the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved behold today is the day of salvation do not wait another day another hour put your faith in Jesus if you'd like to talk about that please talk to someone after the service Aaron or Frank or myself many people here but to those who believe, who have ears to hear, we have a king <laughs> who came in weakness and conquered death. We have a king that we see by the eye of faith, crowned with glory and honor, sitting at God's right hand. We have a king that has truly given us place and power and purpose. Oh, for us that have ears to ear, here upon us has been bestowed the mysteries of the kingdom. I encourage you, read, study, and know more about this king that came. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you this morning for this passage. I thank you that we can read and hear and understand what the Spirit says to the churches through these parables. Father, for those that don't, Father, I pray that your Spirit would be upon them, quickening them to what the Spirit says. Father, I pray that they would put their trust in Jesus. I pray this in your name, Father.